Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education, a podcast that focuses on what is happening in education today, connecting everyone to the movers and shakers that are breaking boundaries in the education arena. Hello, this is Jerry and Jamie from Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education. And, you know, Jerry, sometimes do you some just have those teachers who are advocates for teachers and for kids and is that go-to person uh, in with respect to different issues. Have you known this type of superhero, Jerry? Oh my goodness, have I known this superhero. And I'm so excited to have him with us here today. So let me just tell you a little bit um, about this person. So Holden Krauss is a teacher in Lawrence, Kansas, a math teacher. And I think the first time I became aware of him, we had a student panel and the kids stood up and told about this awesome teacher that was making math come alive for them. And so I was excited to meet Holden then. And then Holden launched a complaint about the tech department. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Because he had a lot of power. He was very respected, right? So I reached out and he and I, I don't know if we went to coffee, if we met, I don't even remember, but we became fast friends. It was just like immediate because I think, uh, well, first of all, he's one of us, those middle school teachers who we've talked about many times were just a little different than the rest, right? And the other thing is his love for kids and helping kids grow to their full potential in everything he does that um, you just can't help but love this guy. So I am honored to have Holden here today as our guest. This summer, he was on a panel for ClassLink. ClassLink likes to do a lot of panels about social issues and things that are happening in the news. And they had a panel with Holden on it. I'll never forget it. My daughter and I were actually out to eat in a restaurant and we had two little earbuds who were both listening to it. And the waitress said, this must really be good because you two haven't even looked at your food. We're just listening to Holden uh, because what his message is, is very powerful. And I know that our listeners today are going to learn a lot. So welcome, Holden Krauss. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here uh, and to see you, Jerry, and get to hang out with you for a little while. That's right. Tell us just a little bit about your background. I told a little bit, but tell us about your background and you recently changed jobs. So bring us up to speed. Yeah, uh, so as you said, I worked for Lawrence Public Schools. I was an eighth grade math teacher for nine years. Um, And in that role, did a lot of different things. I took a hand in technology. Um, I took some leadership roles within the building and um, really got involved in LGBTQ student advocacy. It's where my heart lives. Uh, It's directly connected to me. I am an out proud gay educator. And if I had had the research that exists now when I was a student, I can only imagine how much different my student experience would have been. Research and and support, I bet, right? Yes, yes. Um, Which we'll we'll get into, I love talking about the data and things. uh, So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I did recently change jobs. I'm now in Kansas City, Kansas as an instructional coach. Um, It gives me a little bit of a different angle on the system, a little bit uh, of an opportunity to have a different or maybe even greater impact than I've been able to have within my classroom. So uh, I'm incredibly excited to kind of step out or step up into the bigger world of the system. I am also uh, a GLSEN certified facilitator. We'll talk about what GLSEN is and um, some of the work that they do a little bit later. That's really formalized my advocacy work that I have been doing with kids in 2019. I've been working with them since then for a short while. I was a professional development coordinator for our chapter as well. So um, a little bit more of the behind the scenes work affecting change in different ways. And then if that wasn't enough to fill my time, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, my dissertation is all I have remaining. I'm going to do that with queer theory and LGBTQ students in math. So 
um, leveraging all of my spheres of influence. And, and. Yes, there's more. Yeah, there's more. I sing with a Heartland Men's Chorus uh, and use my voice in that arena to continue to do activism in our community uh, and bring awareness to, to LGBT issues. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm all over the place. It's uh, plenty of time to stay at home and sleep, you know? Yeah, right. But I love how it's all coming together with your dissertation. So yeah. you're pulling it all together. That's great. It's going to be a, a really nice uh, reflection process for you, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah It'll great. be uh, interesting to see how all of those different ways I interact with advocacy come together and, and appear uh, in my final dissertation, so. Yeah, that's terrific. So, you know, Jerry has obviously uh, sung your praises um, and we, I wanna hear a little bit more about your support for your students. As you mentioned before, you know, when you grew up, you didn't have that support. So now you are providing that for students and um, allowing them to feel safe and heard and valued. So how do you do that? And how did you initiate that? So growing up, uh, I grew up in a very, very small community, a rural community that's um, in, in Kansas in the Midwest is actually a common lived experience for LGBT students. Uh, we had spaces in my school, there was no gay straight alliance. There was no uh, out educators. There was no research or resource person that I could go to um, and, and just figure things out. So it was me and the internet, you know, at, at the time, which, you know, the internet was chat room based instead of um, as media based as it is now. I think it's much more helpful. So bringing those experiences into my my practice, uh, I realized very early on in Lawrence that we had students that were much more comfortable being who they are, living authentically, um, but still needed the support. And as an educator, there were lots of little things that I could do, um, like wearing a rainbow, rainbow lanyard with my ID badge, kind of highlighting who I am, uh, intervening when I hear homophobic remarks, doing all of the, the normal behavior management things that teachers do. Uh, and then students came to me and asked if we could start a gay straight alliance uh, at the school. And so I when jumped was on that, it. By the way? Huh? Sorry, when was that, by the way? Uh, that club was formed in 2015. Okay. I started there in 2012, so mm -hmm. a couple of years of establishing myself, uh, and then I was the sponsor for um, the last six years of that. So uh, at the middle school level, it looks different than most people might read about GSAs as, you know, they're clubs at the high school level. They're out doing things. They're participating in activity nights. They're forming those out community vibes. At the middle school level, it's mostly just needing a space to be. Uh, and so for six years, that's what I provided at least one hour a week is a space to be, which LGBT people uh, in general still don't have a lot of spaces to just be. Um, and so that, that work definitely held my heart. It led me to GLSEN. It led me to becoming a certified facilitator because I knew I could help bring other teachers along and spread that ripple out uh, and get more spaces that we could just be. I remember being in a meeting and I think it was you that said that you were having your students actually educate teachers at the middle school. I love that. Like, what did that look like? Kids today more than ever are so willing to, to speak on things that they know, they are willing to be the experts in the room. And it really changes the power dynamic in a building when students are given the ability to teach teachers. That's their lived experience. They are truly the experts in the room. Um, and so being able to push that message back along the information highway that we establish, uh, it opens some teachers' eyes. They're seeing it firsthand it's their students, their uh, kids in their classroom who are saying, this is what I experience on a daily basis that you don't normally see. Like it doesn't register for you because you're not looking for it. But these are the things that I get all the time. Uh, 
whenever we can engage students in that education role, the impact is so much greater than me as an educator talking to fellow educators. It's uh, so true, you know, because it's such a it's such a learning um, opportunity for students, first of all, but you know, it doesn't just happen. I mean, that culture has to be um, established. That foundation has to be there. That that support needs to be there to allow for students to have that voice. And obviously you are providing that for them. You're giving them that stage. And it, what it does in turn is it allows for a much rich, richer professional development experience for teachers uh, when they're hearing it from the students, not about the students. And of course, for professional development for students as well, learning development. So. Um, I mean, it, it really just starts with people like you, giving them that opportunity, allowing them to feel confident and safe in doing that. So that's huge. That's huge. And I love the fact that this is happening in the middle school level, because that way, and just like you said, at the high school level, the kids are actually going out there and, you know, making a difference in the world. Well, they need to have the foundation to get to that space. And they can, and having this space where they can just be and share their feelings and share their experiences with others in a very um, comfortable and safe environment, that's so uh, relevant for that middle school level. That's great, really right. perfect. It helps them build up that confidence when they know that they've got people standing behind them that will, will catch them when they fall, if they're talking to teachers and they stumble. Like they can look to me as a source of confidence in the, in the space. Um, and it, it develops them into the people that we want them to be at the high school level, affecting change, that graduate and affect change. And so the ripple from starting them at the middle level uh, with that leadership role, really, it, it goes all the way through the rest of society. So um, it's definitely something that I support everywhere I am. Yes. Well, you've mentioned GLSEN several times. Um, First of all, what does that stand for? And tell us a little bit about the organization and what you do with that organization and how it shapes schools. So GLSEN, uh, G-L-S-E-N, is formally known as the Gay and Lesbian Straight Education Network. In uh, 2017, I think it was, they rebranded and just shortened it to GLSEN, uh, which is the acronym. GLSEN is the leading national research and advocacy organization for LGBTQ students in schools. They've been around since the 90s, publishing legitimate research since 1999 with the first publication of their school climate survey that they complete every two years. And so we have access, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of data from the 2019 survey. The 2021 survey is going to be starting uh, its data collection here pretty soon. I think it might have already started in some portions of the, of the country, but um, they're still looking for participants. So we're, we're building that study up. The 2019 study was released during the pandemic, uh, published during the pandemic. And this organization has been doing the work for 30 years. So we have a long-standing historical research background that we can do some comparison uh, across the, the decades. Um, what we found in the 2019 survey is that we have, of LGBTQ students who participated, 59.1% feel unsafe at school because they face discrimination on their sexual orientation. Wow. What are the ages? Sorry, I just want to double check on that. Middle through high school is okay. generally the participant age. Okay. Uh, we've got 42%, 43% that don't feel safe because of their gender identity. Um, so that's our transgender, our non-binary students. The one that really caught me, I think the most off guard, is somebody who does the work and lives in this research, um, is that 98.8% of participants reported hearing the word gay used in a negative way in their school. And as a, a society who, you know, being gay isn't something that happens in the shadows anymore. It's not something that's, um, you know, hidden away from society, still hearing that 98.8% of participants are, are hearing that used in a negative way. Um, 
was kind of shocking to me. We've got 14% that say school staff intervene. Well, if 98% of kids are hearing it, and only 14% of them can say that a school mm-hmm. staff member wow. intervened, uh, we've still got some work to do. There's a lot, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the one that really got me was that 52% heard teachers using that oh. language. No. Half? Over half of our participants oh. said that they heard teachers uh, oh. making homophobic remarks. And it gets even worse for gender expression. Almost 67%, two thirds of the participants heard teachers talking about gender expression in a negative way, commenting on students' clothing or the way that they look uh, and how it doesn't align with what this teacher feels is uh, traditional. That data is in the, the school climate survey. There's so much more there that I would encourage everybody to go to glisten.org and look it up and read through there because it can inform your practice so much better. And what Glisten um, consistently finds in the 30 years of research is that students who are experiencing all of this discrimination are more likely to be absent from school one or more times in a month. Most of them four or more times in a month were affecting instruction. They have lower overall GPAs. They're less likely to go on after secondary school. They have lower uh, self-esteem, higher levels of depression. This is affecting those students in a way that makes school a not safe place to be. And if it's not safe, how are these students learning? How are we helping them to grow? Uh, And so GLSEN, um, because of our research, has identified four ways that school districts and that teachers can be supportive of not only LGBTQ students, but all students. One of them is establishing and promoting and uh, celebrating our Gay Straight Alliance clubs. The existence of those in a building, uh, and it's in the school climate survey, shows that those students who had one available experience less of all of the negative discrimination that they compared to students who don't have access to one. And that's just from the existence of the club in the building. So having one staff member step up and say, this is going to be a space where we're going to be able, you you can come and just be, has so much of an effect on the entire building with the use of the language. It just becomes commonplace um, and not so other that students feel like they, they're a little bit more conscious and intentional about the language that they use. We also believe in effective educators offering PD. Glisten, that's the majority of the work that we do our leading PD sessions with schools um, in order to help them learn what they don't know, to help work on that 53% who would use homophobic remarks in a, in a hallway, um, you know, affecting that. Inclusive policies. We have a lot of, of non-discrimination policies. Everybody has one, but how many of them are comprehensive? How many include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression? as enumerated classes. Uh, And the data would say only 14% of the students that reported on the survey had a district that had a policy that was comprehensive. Uh, And then the last one is inclusive curriculum. Showing students positive portrayals of LGBTQ people and uh, our contributions to society, not just leaving us out on the sidelines. And so if districts can do those four things or incorporate those four things, it not only leads to increased, more positive experiences for for LGBTQ students, but it actually has an effect on all students in a space. And that's what we want as teachers. We want the space to be a positive growth oriented space for all of our students. Uh, So if we can affect that by making some small changes, um, what a better way to get involved. Yeah, you know, it all starts with empathy. It really does and I, it seems so uh, basic, but I think, you know, when, when you talked about development that GLSEN does, what are some of those topics? How, how can you overcome um, that, that drastic 50 something percent that we were looking at? For teachers? Right. So every chapter, we have 43 chapters across 30 states. Um, so in two thirds of the country, you have local access to a GLSEN rep. And in the places where we don't have chapters yet, the national office is willing to fly out and do PDs or connect you with the the closest. We do um, basic trainings. 
on how to be an ally. That includes the, the, the small things that individual teachers can do, like putting a rainbow pin on their lanyard. That is such a small, incredibly uh, overlooked thing. But if you're an LGBTQ student who's not sure if they have a safe space, that one icon is enough for you to know there's somebody here that has my back. There's somebody it's not overlooked here. by them, right? Right. It's not overlooked by them. Yeah. They notice all of those things. A little tiny parade pride flag hanging in a coffee cup on your desk space. They're going to notice those things. Uh, and they're going to notice if, you, if you're one of the people who intervene when you hear negative comments, when you hear homophobia or transphobia uh, being spoken in our hallways. They take notice of that. They may never say thank you, but you know that it's there once you start doing the work. Um, so Glisten does talk about how to do allyship. We also talk about changing the game. What does sports and locker rooms look like if we're in inclusive spaces? Because that's been a big topic of conversation uh, in our, our culture, our society, and in our school systems. How do we meet the needs of all students in an inclusive way when we're talking sports or locker rooms? Um, and we do, we actually partnered with the Trevor Project to put together a mental health training module, um, mainly geared towards school counseling and social work um, people. But we have kind of a wide a variety of all these training modules that are available. They're research backed. They're supported by our 30 years of research and experience uh, and often led by people with the lived experience to provide you the personal aspect. So, uh, if you're if you're in a place that needs or that you feel needs that kind of PD, definitely reach out to a Glisten organization. You can contact Glisten.org and they'll funnel you down to whoever's closest and um, most likely to be able to help you. Right. Just last week, Holden, she had asked her district for some support um, with working with some LGBTQ students in her classroom, and the district said they weren't ready for it yet. Uh, how can that teacher respond to the district? What do you say to, to that when the district says, we're just not ready for that? That's actually so much of a common experience. It is. Um, for teachers, because we, we still have a lot of work to do as an educational system to move things along and change is scary. It most of the time involves money, although Glisten stuff doesn't really involve a lot of additional resources. Um, so it's a little bit easier to, to get into. For the teacher who, um, whose district says they're not ready, I would say your students aren't waiting for you. Your students are ready. Yes. Your students are in dire need of change. Yes. And if we're the adults in this space saying, oh, I can't do that because I'm not ready, those kids are going to lose all faith in everything that our system does. So we have Great to point. be responsive. Uh, and if we're not going to push the district forward, then the work just falls into the wayside and those students continue on living an experience of this is just another place that I don't belong. And we don't want any student to feel that way. You know, that answer exemplifies the problem, right? Because it's not about the teachers, it's about the students. So that really just is the, where the problems lie. We really just need to uh, regard whether teachers are comfortable with it or because it's supporting the students and that's what it's all about. Right, everything that we do, everything that we do from curriculum, from behavior management, everything that the system engages in is should be student-centered. And this is one more support that we can put into place that is student-centered and has a bigger effect. It actually has a measurable effect on your entire school climate. So if you're looking at those uh, from just the, even the data side, and pulling it away from the students altogether. It's totally supported all the way through. Um, and it, all it takes is one person, one person to be brave enough and say, my students need this. I'm gonna do what's best, what the research says my students need. Um, and I'm willing to, to be the voice of conflict if that's what's needed at the district level to, to push the conversation forward. Um, I've been very lucky to be in districts where I haven't had to be the voice of conflict. I've had people on the inside like Jerry that uh, I can always go to and we could get things started. Um, 
but sometimes, especially if you're in a rural space where that's not the, the, the major conversation, you might have to be the person that just says, you know what, this, it's enough. I have one kid here who says they need the support. Let's get it done. That's right. That's right. I'm thinking about, you know, teachers too, who need that support and need this uh, culture of acceptance because teachers are in this situation as well. I mean, Holden, you, you, you have the, the courage and the leadership, right, to really be in the front of this, but some teachers don't. Um, and so I, I'm, I can imagine how um, embraced that teachers would feel when this initiative um, is underway. And right. Doesn't... There's still so many places in this country where I would not be employed. I would either be hired and fired or just excluded from employment consideration because I am an out proud gay man. I refuse to hide my identity anymore to fit into that system. Um, I've, you know, I've done that for 25 years. I, I won't do it for the rest. And so there's still a lot of places where staff have to live in the closet at work. They can't put up the pictures of their loved ones like their uh, heterosexual colleagues can. There's so many of those components. We actually just had a teacher in Missouri who was fired for, um, they had put up a rainbow flag with a message, all students are welcome. And a parent complained that it was teaching an LGBT curriculum. Uh, just having those things up, the district made them take it down. And when he um, pushed back on it, he was let go. That's still a lived experience for gay teachers, uh, LGBTQ teachers that are out there and our trans teachers, our non-binary teachers, feature or face even a, an added level that our gay and lesbian teachers don't necessarily have to encounter. So if I can be a voice in the edge world that um, makes it a space where people know they can look for education, our, our allied teachers can become educated at glisten.org, they can look up research, they can find uh, what to do type scenarios to help them grow their confidence. It's just about changing the world one heart at a time. You know, you mentioned LGBTQIA curriculum. Um, I know that certain uh, states have adopted that. Um, I know I'm in New Jersey and we do. Uh, it does. A handful of others, not many. But, you know, there, there is fear behind that. And of course, fear is always bred from the unknown, right? So can you shed light on what this curriculum actually means? I mean, to me, I would assume that it means to teach acceptance, uh, teach awareness. What else are we looking at here when we talk about uh, the curriculum? We even have content-based things. We teach about race uh, in terms of slavery. We teach about race in terms of Jim Crow. We teach about race in terms of all of these different historical events. Gay people have those, have similar historical events. We can teach about the fight for civil rights from more than just a race focused center. We can teach about it, including our LGBTQ focused events. There are diner sit-ins, there are um, you know, diner fights that have happened to move the conversation forward. The um, riots on Christopher Street in the 60s. These are events that we can talk about as sparking the modern movement for civil rights. And we can include them alongside the ones that we're already teaching. Now we've opened, we've expanded the, uh, the look at what civil rights is. Who does it include? What work is being done and still being done? Um, to move it forward. We can talk about Supreme Court rulings, about being gay or being able to marry or being able to adopt. These are still very current things that are happening in the civil rights movement to push everybody forward. And so an inclusive curriculum would include those things in a positive light. Um, we can teach them. It's fine. It happened. It's our history. It's not teaching a student to be gay by teaching them historical things. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of the pushback, is that people feel like anytime you see LGBTQ written in a standard, it's teaching a student how to be gay. Well, I don't know about anybody else in the world, but I, that's not a lesson I ever sat down and, and took a test on. Like, uh, it's, it's something that we kind of naturally know, uh, we develop. So 
The inclusive curriculum is hard, and it's hard when you think about it from different content perspectives. You now, I gave you a social studies example. Social studies in English are going to be more apt to pick up those components because they're easier to get to, they're more accessible from the current content. If you're thinking about mathematics and science, it's a little bit more skill-based. So it's not so much about identity, who you are and how that affects the world around you. It's about interacting with these skills and these concepts. Uh, but there's still ways that we can do it. We can talk about famous mathematicians who faced persecution for being gay, but still contributed to mathematics, who still moved science forward uh, and give the role models that these people need. If we can get our LGBTQ students who are interested in STEM to stay interested because they know somebody who was gay, who was a lesbian, who was transgender, still contributed in such a huge way to what we do now, they've got somebody to look forward to. I can do this because they did it. And that's where, that's what we want them to have. We want them to have that light and that passion to, to stay moving forward. It's so important to see yourself in, in the curriculum and what's happening to give you that inspiration to move forward. That's right. Gosh, Holden, this has, I'm just taking so many thoughts in. You, you really enlighten everyone every time you talk to them. And it's been fun to watch you on your journey. Um, and I can, I've just been so proud of you every step of the way because you just continue to grow and serve and empower. And you're just such a special person and such a special educator. And we're so lucky to have you here in Kansas. Thanks so much. Um, I would definitely say that education is one of my callings, but LGBTQ it is. advocacy is the other. Absolutely. Um, walk hand in hand as often as possible. Absolutely. And did you, did you mention in the podcast or before the show that you are working on your doctoral dissertation in this area? Yeah, I talked yes. about it in my, uh, my intro. Um, okay, I, I couldn't remember. We talked about so much before the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So good. That Hopefully will be, I'll be wrapping that up in May of 2022. That's the, ah, oh man. That's coming up fast. Yeah, uh, don't remind me. Yes. I just have one follow-up question. And I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but how did the pandemic affect our students, our LGBTQ students? Did it have a harder impact on them? Did it make life easier for them? What, what did you see? I haven't seen any research come out about it yet to uh, center that, I, although I would um, bet that that research is being conducted and analyzed right now. From what I know from students that I've worked with, uh, the pandemic hit them really hard because it removed their sense of community. For some students, the only space that they had to be themselves was that one hour after school, one day a week. And when we're not meeting in person, that removes that. Uh, and some, you know, some students are comfortable zooming into a group and meeting, but at the middle level, you still have a lot of students who aren't out at home, who are fearful of being out at home. And so if they're at home zooming in, yeah, it doesn't help them. It's still an unsafe space. So, um, the impact, yeah, was that a lot of students felt like they were alone, so they turned to social media, and I am a big social media proponent. TikTok has been a, a, a cove for those students to still feel connected. Snapchat has let them stay connected to the people that they have in their community, uh, and so in that way, technology allowed them to supplement or to replace what their, their normal community sense was like, um, and hopefully build up some better communities that we can keep going even after we return to in-person meetings and they still have that support again, um, but we can build the online presence and reach those kids who don't have the, the in-person community. Yes. You know, you brought up something else that I have to ask another question because this one is really controversial at district level. And that is if a student comes out at school Many district leaders and teachers feel like it's their obligation to tell the parent that the student has come out. 
what is your thinking on this and what is the best practice? My thinking is never do it. Um, it's never not do our, what? Never, never out a student to people who, who don't know. Okay, uh, because? It's not our story to tell. It's that student's story, that student's decision. Uh, and that was a central theme in the movie Love, Simon. We had a student who outed another student to their school community. And one of the lines that Simon says is it was my story to tell and you took that from me. Uh, and it potentially, we hope not, but it potentially could create unsafe spaces out of their building. Right, right. Out in the community, whether it's at home or whether it's with grandma and grandpa or whether it's their friend group, you know, abandons them. It can create all those additional spaces. So for teachers that are in that space, if you have a student who's willing to talk to you about it, that's the best way to move forward. Move forward with both you and the student and anyone else who knows or should know in on that conversation at the school level. Is this a name that we just use at school? Is this a name I can use with other people? I can use with your parents and parent-teacher conferences. Are these pronouns just things that you use at school? Or are they things that you use out of school as well? Um, because we have so many spaces where we get to know students at a deeper level than the general community. Uh, and there's things that they're willing to tell teachers that they trust that they don't share otherwise because they only see us for an hour. You know, they can say it and kind of walk away. Whereas if they say it at home, they have to continually live that truth uh, in that moment over and over again. So um, in that case, I would say involve the student in anything that you think you're gonna do. Now, legally, there is still a kind of a gray space. When this first became kind of a widespread issue in 2016, um, the legal guidance was, if a student tells you this, you have to report it home. You have to call home and ask about an official name change, if it's okay if you use their pronouns. The research says if you are not using their name and their pronouns, you're causing harm to that student. You're becoming an oppressor to that student. So the best practice is support the student no matter what else is going on. Um, and legally, we're in a gray area now. You've got a lot of districts who will say, we'll support you. They're outright about that. You've got a lot of districts who say, we won't. And you've got some in the middle who are case by case. Uh, it kind of depends on the administrator that you're dealing with. So um, your private conversations always key. And tying in your administrator if you think that they're safe and supportive and um, won't create a, uh, a negative problem for the student. Right. Such great advice and insight. This has just been fabulous, Holden. This has Thank been you. I'm glad I could help. Podcast. Oh, immensely. And I hope so many teachers will listen to this podcast because I think it gives them a really good direction to help, as you said, all students. Yeah, that's our key. And it should be our key for every teacher helping all. Yes, absolutely. Wow. wow. So glisten.org, no, glisten right? Because of course you were chock full of amazing information. And if people want to follow up, glisten.org, are there is there a specific place there that you recommend to start? When they, when they get to the website uh, across the top, it'll say our work. And you can hover over that. It'll drop down a menu where you can access their work in research. You can access their work in curriculum uh, and their work in PD. Uh, so you can kind of navigate from there where you need to be or what you're looking for. And is it G-L-S-E-N? Yep, G-L-S-E-N.org. Okay. And where can people follow you personally? So I do have... Um, some Twitter accounts. I don't necessarily use them all for professional things, so I don't share them all. But on Twitter, you can follow me at you, the letter U, only Kraus once. Uh, and that actually was inspired by some students back when YOLO was a thing. They came to my space and they said Yoko, and it turned into you only Kraus once. Uh, and it became kind of a hope and a mission <laughs> for all of us. But you, the letter only Kraus once. Yes, I love that. Okay, at Twitter. Is that yep, the main place Twitter. to follow you? That is. Okay. Jerry, we spent, sorry, Jerry, we've spent several months trying to find the perfect people to do this webinar, right? Right. Well, we 
we didn't need multiple people. We have everything we needed in Holden. Yes. And I, I mean, I, and I mean that from the heart, I just, I am so thankful that you were able to join us and help everyone because there, it, there's still a lot of work to do as you have. So much work. Yeah. <laughs> there I mean, is. So much work. So. And Holden, I, I hate to say it, but we had some administrators that were a on because the podcast might um, cause them problems. Yeah, it could be controversial. Yeah. Um, it, it's certainly a thing. I mean, it's still out there. Even presenting to ClassLink this summer, which was an honor to do, I had a very small number of companies reach out to me in June to do something like this because it's still work that's happening in the business world too. We're still trying to get that off the ground. Uh, and so having organizations and businesses like ClassLink that reach out and really invest in the work, um, even at a surface level, just to get their hands dirty in the work, it helps us spread the message and, and cause those ripples that we need to eventually affect the change. Wow. Well, my inbox blew up after you were on that panel. People saying, wow, how did you know this guy? Where, why did you keep him a secret? <laughs> So, and Jamie said that to me too. Why hasn't he been on the show earlier? And I was just like, you know. Right. So glad you're here now. I'm so glad I could join you. This is, like I said, one of my passionate topics. So um, reach out to me on Twitter if you're, if you're watching and you have questions or you need more resources, you know, follow me on Twitter and, and send me a, a tweet. I'll get back to you about um, some things. Like I'll get you the resources that maybe you need or point you in the right direction. Like I said, it's all about causing that ripple. I just need one person. If I can get one person to make a change, then that one person's gonna affect the next person and we can build up this um, wave of support. Oh, thank you so much for all the work you're doing, Holden. Thanks again. You bet. Thank you for listening. And if you would like to stay linked up, be sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube. 